so much for doing this. Oh, of for course, real. it's like, getting hot. It is getting very hot here. As Nelly wants so. But no, I totally like sent you just a random email, and you didn't have to like respond. It is so a pleasure. And, and I love. To your car. Welcome to my Honda CRV. <laughs> <laughs> mm, we have everything: the Bluetooth seat warmers. Yo. I know. I don't know. This, I think, maybe you can like. Oh, and I don't know what that means. I'm old. I mentioned to you in the email that the last time I saw you play, you were doing a couple nights with the Breeders. And it's like kind of an interesting juxtaposition to like see you play last night, like a community run DIY space. But you're no stranger to spaces like that. So it's kind of like a return to form for you. How does, how does that feel? I can say that even towards the end of Screaming Females, like uh, we weren't ever against playing in community centers. I think those are actually the types of spaces that we preferred, all ages spaces that kind of like cultivated community or catered to their community beyond just like, you know, going to a bar to drink. Not that there's anything wrong with going to a bar to drink, but that's fine. Um, it's just, uh, I think uh, the landscape for live music has changed a lot and a lot of those places, unfortunately, uh, find it really hard to, to exist. So a place like um, Lost Bag in Providence last night is, was a really special place and it was nice to, to be in a space like that. Yeah, it was yeah. cool to see you play a space like that. Yeah, thanks for coming. I've listened to a lot of interviews of yours, and I've heard you talk about how, like, towards the start of your journey playing shows when you first started doing DIY shows, like, there wasn't much emphasis on, like, inclusion because you were just happy something was happening. You were just happy there were shows to go to. But now that you're older and you, like, have the capability of bringing, like, a little bit more intention to it, like, what are you doing to like make spaces like more inclusive or make the shows that you play more inclusive, I guess I should say. Screaming Females always made a point of trying to make sure that when we did bring other bands on tour with us, it wasn't just a band of cis head white men. Right. Um, and um, that wasn't always successful. It's not always completely possible, you know, like life is complicated, but we definitely made uh, made a very concerted effort to do that and um, I will continue that practice in my future musical endeavors. And, and why is it important to like highlight and play with like women, queer folks, marginalized people? Well because cis uh, white heterosexual men have dominated uh, everything <laughs> <laughs> for as long as I guess I've been involved in music and certainly before beforehand and so it's really important to give platforms to people who might otherwise go ignored or um, aren't having their voices heard I'm mean, one of the most important things I think you can do for um, as, a, as a radical act is to, is to give marginalized or unheard people a platform so they can speak their truth. Do you have any advice to young marginalized people like struggling to either like find a scene to break into or struggling to find acceptance in their scene? I'm such a hermit. I'm really surprised that I ever managed to like get out and do stuff. I, I had to really force myself. So I guess um, my only advice would just be like, don't, don't be afraid. Just get go outside go to the show like it won't be that bad nice <laughs> talk to a couple of people who you think might kind of have the same agenda as you and hopefully you know you'll find your, your little niche so peace meter fantastic record thank you um that was notably a record that you collaborated with vows andy gibbs mm -hmm. on which is really cool and you were also featured on the most recent here's collective record you've never really shied away from like playing with hardcore bands or grindcore bands um, and you have tons of friends in those communities. So can you talk to me about like this multidisciplinary approach to music? I think when you're like a student of music or you're like a really big fan of music, you probably celebrate all different kinds of it. Be really boring if you only listen to like one genre type sounding of, of, of tunes. So, I mean, Phil, Phil knows. We, <laughs> we started off yesterday listening to Snapcase and we finished today off listening to uh, that Macy Gray song. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yes, variety is the spice of life. I actually found a flyer on the firehouse. Is uh, it the Mitski flyer? Yeah, it's the Mitski <laughs> flyer. It's, what do you remember about playing with Mitski at firehouse? Like, that's so random. Uh, I think we did, like, a week with her, maybe? That's why. Uh, it was right after Makeout Creek came out. Very cool. Um, and she was briefly on Don Giovanni Records, which is our label. Right. Um, and it was fun. We went up to Canada, played Firehouse, which was a place we had been before, and we really always loved going to Worcester. Fuck yeah. And um, we slept upstairs. And Did you have to sleep on dog beds? 
I've never slept on the dog bed up there. I usually pick the couch, <laughs> but uh, I'm I'm a frequent visitor. So. I see, I see, I see. Yeah. What about playing Worcester has like been notable to you over the years? I think Pete, who we were speaking of, is a true hero of DIY. Pete has always gone out of his way to uh, put on cool shows for Screaming Females and for Noun, which is the name I'm currently performing under. Um, I've actually played in Worcester twice as now, and I think it's the city I've played the most in this iteration, which hasn't played out very much. Um, and Worcester reminds me a lot of New Brunswick. Nice. You know, it's like a tiny city, and there aren't a lot of people there, and the people who are there who are into, like, arts and uh, the arts in any capacity are, seem to be really tight with each other. Um, and I don't know, he's just a reliable, wonderful person who... Um, really just loves music and isn't expecting anything from anyone really he just wants to like put on a good show and have a enjoyable evening and then go out to karaoke that's a good way to put that <laughs> and yeah can you speak to the importance of like having people like pete in music communities that are just like down for it no matter what there's there's no, nothing better than having somebody that reliable consistent and kind um to be there for you when you pass through their city it makes it feel like home it's really nice, yeah. Looking back on your career, like, I'm glad you don't, but I'm very shocked you don't have a, like, like quit while you're ahead mindset. Because, you know, <laughs> you, you've been on tour with Garbage, Breeders, you played with Dino Jr., huge festivals, you, you've played in all 50 states. Like, where does the drive to keep creating and performing live come from nowadays? I just like it. <laughs> I just like it. It's fun. It makes me, it brings me, like, joy and fulfillment. Um, it's nice that people come to see me or you know see my different kind of projects perform it means a lot to me but um i I don't i don't know if i would ever stop writing songs or or making paintings or drawings if no one came at all it's it's a it's a compulsion it's what that's what it feels like it feels like a compulsion but it also makes me happy sometimes (laughs) sometimes it makes me really frustrated (laughs) You made a Patreon recently, mm-hmm. so is art and music your full-time career right now? Like, do you, like, do you have another side job or something? Or? At the moment, yeah, I would I would say it's my full-time job. I take commissions, like, um, uh, do some drawings for people. A lot of people ask me to draw their pets, and I always send an email back telling you that if I'm going to draw your pet, your pet's going to look very scary. <laughs> so if you don't want that, please don't hire me. Um, and people seem to want to have very scary portraits of their pets. Uh, so I do stuff like that, and I did that all through Scream Mails too. Yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful to be able to, to just kind of like take a, a beat at home, and um, Phil and I have been like writing a lot of songs at home and setting up like a better kind of home recording situation. I've been lucky enough to ha- have music be my full-time job for the bulk of my adult life, so I, I continue to be very grateful for that. Hell yeah. Was it like a difficult process making that a reality? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, uh, I basically, I, it's still hard right now. It's, you know, I I don't know what I'm necessarily reaching for because I kind of, right now I'm getting to do the thing that I definitely want to do, which is write music and go out and play it and stuff. But, um, but yeah, I mean, at first, I mean, Screaming Females played over 1,500 shows, so it's a lot of hard work. <laughs> between the three of us yeah it's really incredible and yeah what what feelings do you associate you mentioned gratitude is that like the big one that comes to mind when you think about how you get to wake up and do what you love every day for a living yeah i I would definitely say it's gratitude i have endless thanks to all of the people who like take the time to listen to my music or just pay attention to the fact that i exist in any capacity it's very very nice of them to do that we're getting close to the end here Mm -hmm. but I want to know, the flyer for the show says noun, and then there's a little tagline, Marissa Paternoster of Screaming Females. Are you okay with Screaming Females, like, being a really big part of your legacy? Is any part of you trying to, like, distance yourself from that part in your life? Because I know it was, like, a big part of your identity for Mm. so long. I mean, I think that would be an absurd, like, thing for me to try to do. I mean, Screaming Females was um, the most important project that I ever pursued uh, thus far in my, like, creative life. But it also was like 
so many of my formative experiences just as a human being happened within the context of Screaming Females. I was 19 when we started the band and I'm 37 now. So everything that I've ever known about being an adult kind of happened in the shadow of like this massive thing. So, and I'm so grateful for all of the experiences that we had and all the things that we did. Like I got to see a lot of the world and that's like, you know, I would have never been able to do that without Screaming Females. So I, no, I certainly am not trying to distance myself from it at all. And if that's how people remember me, I that's great because I'm really proud of everything we ever did. Talk to me about your graphic novel, Merry Men. Y- uh, your first graphic novel ever coming out. You're going on a book tour soon. Yeah. Going that's to Barnes. so exciting. Going to Bar- your local Barnes & Noble, maybe, Whoa. if it's still there. Crazy. Yeah. Like the one in, near Worcester, you mean? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I okay. wish. You said I wish. you're local. I was no, like, wait, I, am I local? I was just, I was kind of joking, but okay. if the okay. Barnes & Noble in Worcester wants to hit us up, <laughs> Go for it. Joe Steinhardt, who runs Don Giovanni Records, wrote a a graphic novel. He sent it to me in kind of like a screenplay format, and um, uh, I kind of ignored him (laughs) for a while because I was like, I'm busy, I can't read this thing. And then I I read it, and I was like, this is actually pretty funny. But I was like, I I don't really think I have time because drawing a comic, it takes a really fucking long time. And I've I've only really drawn like 20 panel comics at the most. I certainly have never drawn a graphic novel, nor did I ever think that I would. But then COVID happened and all of a sudden I had a, an incredible amount of time <laughs> to sit at home and draw. And so I was like, okay, well, let's let's do this. Um, and then it took two and a half years to finish drawing it. It was a really interesting, incredibly difficult pro- process. Um, I'm really proud of Joe and of myself. Um, and maybe I'll do it again someday. I have no idea. Yeah, but it comes out on March 19th. If you have the means, to go grab it please grab a copy and uh i hope you don't hate it i hope you at least like the drawings i'm sure they're great i didn't write it (laughs) those are all my like formal questions and i just have like a bunch of random ones um what do you remember about playing urban outfitters in austin texas in 2011 (laughs) why are you doing this (laughs) i remember that they wanted to give us all turntables (laughs) Because remember, they were like, we have vinyl at Urban Outfitters. And I was like, I'm never home. I don't want that. And I think... Like, we can't give these yeah, away. Yeah, they couldn't give them away. I think maybe one of my... One, either Mike or Jared got the turntable and probably sold it. Um, didn't we play out? We played outside. Yeah. South by Southwest. Oof. What a wacky ride. Question. Were you there? No, I just... I'm like, you seem like you're too young. You would have been like an infant. I would have been like 14 years old. Oh, cute. <laughs> no, I've just a uh, little, little thoroughly researched here. I just went through the screen. Are you nardwaring me? I'm trying to. I don't know if I'm doing a good job, but like... Nardware would be so bored with me. <laughs> Nardware would have your birth certificate. Nardware would find out that I don't have a middle name. Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> you can't answer this with a person. What are you deeply in love with right now? Is the answer George Michael? Oh, well, no, I was gonna say Phil. Aww. Get a good look at him. But the answer is actually eating ice. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have an ice machine. My stepmom, Judy Scardilli, got it for me for Christmas, and it makes ice on demand at my home. Christmas. And I eat about five to six glasses of nothing but <laughs> ice a day. And sometimes my mouth gets so cold I can't move it. <laughs> That can't be good for your vocal True. cords. <laughs> True. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and Phil, what's what's playing with Marissa like? What is that experience like? Uh, it's really fun. It's the best. The first day Marissa and I ever met, we played music together, and cool. we instantly realized we were both idiots. You're <laughs> 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 like, cool. You're stupid too. <laughs> And like riffs. So, I was yeah. like, what's your favorite food? And I was like, I don't know, fries. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Anything else you want to tell the people at home? Like, what should they expect from a noun show? Why should they come see you play live? What else you got better to do? <laughs> what are you doing right now? I'm, I'm, come I'm, on. Well, you're here. Well, yeah, right. I'm me right now. I'm here. Oh, I'm not good at self promotion. Can you insert some? That's fine. A PSA for me? But, no. Oh. But. Nuts. That's pretty good. Yeah, come on. Hey. It's gonna be, f- it'll be fine. Just come on. There Step out go. on the town. Hey, right? cozy. Yeah, it'll be nice and cozy. We'll hang out.
Oh, 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 oh,